Good evening. Welcome to Sunday evening worship services. We we'll have two songs before the prayer and scripturing. One more song before the lesson. First song this evening will be number 118. 118. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me, how he left his home in glory for the cross of Calvary. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory, gather I was lost, but Jesus found me, found the sheep that went astray, threw his loving arms around me, drew me back into his way. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. I was bruised, but Jesus healed me. Pain was I for many a fall. Sight was gone, and fears possessed me. But he freed me from them all. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory, gathered by the crystal sea. He will keep me to the river, rolls its waters at my feet, then a bear me safely over where the Lord runs I shall meet. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. So before the prayer and scripture, it will be number 416, 416. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and grace to bear. What a privilege to carry. and forfeit, oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there troubled anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrow share? Amen. 
Covered with a load of care, precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise forsake thee? Take it to the Lord in Let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, I thank you for another opportunity to come and study your word and have fellowship with our fellow Christians. Thank you for watching over us this day and for keeping us safe and healthy and giving us the opportunity to, to come together again. Please open our hearts and our minds to the lessons we're about to hear and help us to understand them and find ways to apply them in our lives so that Others will know you through us, and we can be people that you're proud of, and that you'll one day welcome us into your kingdom. Thank you always for allowing your son to come down, uh, show us how to live our life, and how we should die, and how we should uh, seek to seek to please you. Uh, help us find our way home to your kingdom. In Jesus' name, Amen. This evening's scripture reading is from John chapter 5. I'll be reading verses 1 through 18. I'll be reading from the New American Standard. After these things, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethsaida, having five porticos. In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered, waiting for the moving of the waters. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after the stirring up of the water, stepped in, was made well from whatever disease and with, what, with which he was afflicted. A man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there, he knew that he had already been a long time in that condition, and he said to him, do you wish to get well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. Immediately the man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. Now it was the Sabbath on that day. So the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, it is the Sabbath, and it is not permissible for you to carry your pallet. But he answered them, He who made me well was the one who said to me, Pick up your pallet and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Pick up your pallet and walk? But the man who was healed did not know who, he, who it was, for Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin any more, so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. For this reason the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But he answered them, My father is working until now, and I myself am working. For this reason, the, the, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. <clears throat> Number 197, 197. If you're able to, please stand. <clears throat> Number 197, 197. 
I traveled down a lonely road and no one seemed to care. The burden of my weary back about me to despair. I oft complained to Jesus how folks were treating me. And then I heard him say so tenderly. My feet were also weary upon the Calvary road. The cross became so heavy, I fell beneath the Lord. Be faithful, weary pilgrim, the morning I can see. Just lift your cross and follow close to me. I work so hard for Jesus, I often boast and say. I sacrifice a lot of things to walk the net away. I gave up fame and fortune, I'm worth a lot to thee. And then I hear him gently say to me, I love the throne of glory and counted it but lost. My hands were nailed in anger upon a cruel cross. But now we'll make the journey with your hand safe in mine. So lift your cross and follow close to me. Oh, Jesus, if I die upon a boy and build someday, t'would be no more than love demands, no less could I repay. No greater love hath mortal man than for a friend to die. These are the words he gently spoke to me. Oh, just a cup of water I place within your hand. Then just a cup of water is all that I demand. But if I dare to live, they can my glory see. I'll take my cross and follow close to thee. Song following the lesson will be number 585, 585. Excuse me for one moment. I just wanted to see how it looked. I never get to see. And I know when we change computers that there's a little discrepancy in what we have on the screen and what we have on the screen, if you follow my drift. And I don't understand it. I don't even have any idea how to explain it or fix it, but I am aware of it. I hope it's not distracting to you. If you're visiting with us tonight, we uh, are grateful for your presence. I want to mention that we do have uh, ice cream Sundays available after our service this evening, and everyone is encouraged to stay and enjoy those treats. This happens to be National Ice Cream Day. And I know that we did not plan this based on that. We planned this based on the fact that Kathy Gerber doesn't work this Sunday. So unless she coordinated with uh, someone higher than uh, anybody in this building, it just was happenstance. But we're, we're grateful that we can spend some time in worship and then spend additional time in fellowship and want to encourage all of you uh, to share in that, uh, even if you don't like ice cream, if you're that one in a million, just stay for the fellowship, enjoy the conversation. 
We're continuing our study of the Gospel of Luke tonight, or the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of John tonight. I should have had a nap this afternoon, Bill. But I didn't, in case you're wondering. The Gospel of John, the fifth chapter, and the lengthy text that Kurt read a moment ago is the introduction to chapter 5. There are, in essence, three significant things found in this chapter, and of course the, the picture, I don't know how well you can see it, it didn't appear to me to be very bright, but uh, the picture is just an artistic representation of the healing of the lame man at the pool of Bethesda, which is the first of the three significant things to unfold in chapter 5. And what we've been doing each Sunday night as we go through the gospel is first and foremost, highlight the content of the chapter, and then we'll spend some time with each section so that we leave having a better understanding of what is actually revealed, and just as importantly, what application we ought to make to our lives as New Testament Christians. The healing of the man on the Sabbath at the Pool of Bethesda is followed by a conversation in which Jesus identifies himself with God, proclaiming himself to be the Son of God, making, of course, God his Father, uh, one on which he stands somewhat equal. And this, of course, was extremely offensive to the Jews of the first century. They just could not envision someone who would be so bold as to say, God is my Father. I am here as his Son. I have come to do his will, and if you reject me, you're rejecting him. Can't be, they thought. So Jesus has to be dealt with. So they level charges against him, and these charges obviously are not true, but that doesn't matter. When somebody has it out for somebody else, the truth kind of goes out the window. We see this in politics all the time, and we certainly see it in religion, and in particular in relationship to the leadership in Judaism and how they view Jesus. He was a threat to their position, and so they were willing to say anything, do anything, to destroy him and his ministry including, as you well know, having him crucified. The close of chapter 5 I find truly interesting. From verse 31 through the end of the text, Jesus offers forth arguments for his divinity. I would tell you from my perspective, he gives five unassailable proofs that he is the Son of God. And when people say to us, you can't really know who Jesus was, you can't be sure of what he did, my response is very simply this, I know whom I have believed. This is what Paul said in his letter to Timothy. We can have confidence in who Jesus was, in what he did, and yes, what he demands. And the reason most people don't accept what the gospel reveals about Christ, nor embrace what we find in the epistles about his church and the nature of discipleship. It's not that they can't understand it or that it isn't believable. They just don't like it. Because Jesus has standards for discipleship. There are demands that must be met. There are conditions connected with our salvation. And when we are his disciples, we are to live as disciples of Christ. There ought to be a distinction between children of God and those who are not in God's family. And the sad reality is that those distinctions have been blurred, in fact, are almost non-existent today. There have been studies done over and over again in recent years that have demonstrated every time that there is little difference between the churched and the unchurched in regard to how they live their lives and treat each other. And that is not right. If we are truly disciples of Christ, we are compelled by our Lord to live a distinctive, upright life. The language of Philippians 1.27 is very clear. Your conduct 
should be that which becomes or is guided or determined by the gospel of Jesus Christ. We ought to be asking ourselves every day throughout the day, how would Jesus respond? What would he do? What would he say? And to the best of our ability, that should be our action. Those should be our words, for our goal is to conform to his example and his teaching. Because he was the Son of God. So you've got these three things. The healing of the lame man. Jesus identifying himself with the Father and then stating categorically, there is abundant evidence to support my identity so that you're not left in the dark or in doubt. So let's go through very quickly what we have before us tonight. I understand I had an extra 10 minutes this morning. I didn't realize that. I will tell you that I'm going to finish at 11. You give me an extra 50 minutes. I'm going to finish at 11. So don't worry about it. I will finish on time tonight. But I don't pay much attention to the clock other than I know when I need to stop so that you all can plan your schedules accordingly. So quickly now to section 1, the lame man whom Jesus heals. It occurs on the Sabbath. And, of course, this is a constant criticism leveled by the critics against Christ. He does things, or he authorizes things to be done on the Sabbath, and that's a no-no. The law said you're not to do any work on the Sabbath, and they went so far as defining the nature of work as lifting any burden that weighed as much as a dried fig. Writing any sentence, you couldn't even do anything if someone were injured that would aid in the healing process. You might stop the bleeding, but you couldn't apply ointment or anything that might assist in recovery on the Sabbath. That was considered work. Now, of course, Jesus didn't buy into that, and he pointed out their hypocrisy. He wasn't allowed to do good things for human beings on the Sabbath, but they could lead their donkey or their ox to water on the Sabbath, and that wasn't a problem. Or if they had an animal fall into a pit on the Sabbath, they didn't have any difficulty at all getting that animal out of the pit, the dry cistern. And sometimes the cistern may not be dry. But that animal, it needed to be rescued. That could be done on the Sabbath, but Jesus couldn't heal a man. And the essence of his response is, what are you thinking? The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. God never expected those kinds of applications. So this miracle occurs on the Sabbath at some unnamed Jewish feast. And I don't know which one, but I will tell you, the majority of scholarship thinks that this was a Passover feast. And if, in fact, it was, we're able to date the ministry of Christ as being in excess of three years, just based on the number of Passovers mentioned in John's Gospel. If it's not a Passover feast, then we can't be as certain about how long the ministry of our Lord lasted but at any rate, we know it was not that lengthy, less than four years, probably three, three and a half, if in fact this is a Passover feast. It happened at the Pool of Bethesda, which was by the sheep market, the sheep gate. It was a prominent place known by everyone. There were five porticos, porches, colonnades, uh, that provided some respite from the heat and some relief from the weather at times. And there was a custom, a tradition that said on certain occasions the water is stirred or troubled and the first person in experiences a healing. Now Jesus does not give credibility to that tradition. There's absolutely nothing in Scripture to suggest that such healing actually occurred. John is only acknowledging what was commonly accepted in the first century relative to this pool. The man that Jesus encountered obviously put some stock in the tradition or the belief, but for 38 years he has experienced this infirmity and has been unable 
uh, to find any relief. So in relationship to the miracle, what we have is Jesus singling out a man, a specific man, as I've already said, who had been infirmed for 38 years. That's a long time. My son will be 38 at the end of August. He tells me over and over again, Dad, I'm an old man. And I say, what does that make me then? I don't thir think 38 is really old, but to have this kind of ailment for 38 years, now that would be a challenge. And yet I know people who have carried much heavier burdens for much longer, but this man clearly has a plight that captured the attention of our Lord and being the man of compassion that he was, he was compelled to take action. So he asked, do you want to be healed? Now, what do you think the answer to that question would be? And don't you know that Jesus already knew the answer? But this is all designed for the benefit of others and ultimately for our own benefit as we're able to examine the text. Shouldn't everybody who has a problem want that problem solved? The obvious answer is certainly. But I will tell you realistically that the majority of people are unconcerned about the greatest problem they have, the sin problem. They really are. They're unwilling to let our Lord in his word address the one condition that is more serious than any other. And in fact, I think there's an allusion to that in the text as it unfolds. The man's response was, well, sure I do, but my situation is such that when the angel troubles the water, given my condition, before I can get in, somebody else is already there. So I'm kind of helpless here, and it's really not my fault. I can't get anybody to help me. So what does Jesus do? Remember, it's the Sabbath. He says, rise, take up your bed and walk. Now, keep in mind here, the bed of the first century would probably be better understood in modern terms as a sleeping bag. Or maybe even better, you remember, if you're my age, growing up watching the westerns, and what did all the cowboys have behind their saddle, their bedroll? This would be equivalent to the kind of thing this man had. Just get up, roll that thing up, and walk. You're going to be healed, made completely whole. And so what does the text say in verse 9? The man immediately was healed, and the healing was complete and total. Nothing partial here. In all of the miracles recorded in Scripture, only one that I can think of involved a partial and then a complete healing. And I'm not going to tell you where it is. I want to challenge you to find it. It may be helpful for you to know it involves a blind man. But every other miracle that Jesus did was instant and total. And this is no exception. Later when Jesus encounters the man, he says something that I believe is terribly significant tonight. He says to him, just very pointedly, sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon thee. And yes, there's a, a the, that, that the is T-H-E-E, -E, not T-H-E. Didn't see it in the dozen times I went over this this past week. But I have an excellent bulletin article coming out in the next few weeks that specifically addresses all the mistakes that I make. So look for that. You'll find it very insightful. They only stand out when I've got an audience of 100 plus. But I see it, so you don't need to tell me later. I digress. He's been infirm for 38 years. How could something worse come? Well, that worst thing, folks, is sin and the ultimate outcome when sin is not addressed. The wages of sin is death. Being infirm 38 years is nothing compared to being lost eternally. 
And that's the point that Jesus is trying to drive home. Not just for the sake of this man. Jesus knew full well that his ministry would be recorded, that these stories would be told, that his words would be remembered. And folks, there are matters that matter more than our cough, our arthritis, our sore back, or a host of other far more serious problems medically. The sin problem is the greatest problem we face. It is not cancer. It is not our economy. It is not Russia or China or North Korea. It is sin. And when that problem is addressed as Jesus would have it addressed, all other problems are dwarfed to insignificance. But when we ignore it, Yes, something far, far worse lies ahead in our future. So, there are things worse than physical impairment. This man needs to understand that. He has just encountered the Lord. He's going to have an opportunity to live now a meaningful and productive life. Don't throw it away by giving your life over to the devil and living a life of sin. Sin can cause far more harm than any other problem we face. Remember the words of Solomon in the book of Proverbs, the way of the transgressor is hard. One of the things I've tried to drive home with young people over the years, including my own children, is that choices have consequences. And sinful choices can have dire consequences here and hereafter. Now, please understand, I know that there is always hope, that there is forgiveness available to the truly penitent. But I also know that even when we find forgiveness, that the scars can stay with us for a lifetime. Isn't it far better for us to avoid the sin and the scars that inevitably will fill our lives? Of course it is. And this is what Jesus wanted this man to know. It's what he wants us to know as well. Get your life right with him and stay right with him. Because if you don't, there is something you don't even want to contemplate facing you, facing all of those who turn their back on Jesus and embrace a life of sin. Again, the healing was done on the Sabbath, and this led to criticism. It's interesting to me, people will say today, you need to be more like Jesus. Just be more loving and kinder and more considerate. And people will think better of you and treat you better. Have you not read the Bible, folks? Jesus was the kindest, most considerate, loving person ever to live. He spoke the truth. He always spoke the truth. And he spoke it in the right way. And they nailed him to a cross. Whoa, he said, when all men speak well of you, something's not right. And that shouldn't be our goal anyway. Remember Galatians 1 verse 10, this morning's message? Do we seek to please men or God? If we please men, we should not be the servants of Christ. Jesus was only interested in pleasing the Father. And so he taught the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. They interrogated the man who had been healed, verses 10 through 13. He couldn't tell them at first who had given him the order to take up his bedroll and walk, who it was that healed him. But the man was condemned because he was carrying his bedroll on Saturday. That's what the Sabbath was. Under the law, for Jews, never for Gentiles, but for Jews, it was a day of rest. Not a day of worship, folks. People are just so confused about this. The Sabbath was never designated as a day of worship. It was a day of rest. And in their minds, he was breaking the Sabbath law. And he needed to be held accountable. He said, yeah, I don't know who this man was. What I do know is that he healed me. And he told me to get my bed and walk. 
Why would anybody argue with that? Somebody who can heal me of a problem I have dealt with for 38 years unsuccessfully is somebody I'm going to listen to. Now, if you're a good Bible student, you know that Jesus had not broken any law, and in telling this man to take up his bed and walk, the man broke no law of God. He just violated their traditions, and for them, that was a terrible thing. If you don't understand, read Matthew 15 and the exchange between Jesus and the critics over failing to wash his hands, his disciples failing to wash their hands before they ate. So who healed him? At first, I can't say. He, he disappeared above the crowd. Later in the temple, Jesus found him. Now he can report that it was Jesus who healed him. What happens? The Jews start leveling charges against him. They point the accusing finger, say, that man, Jesus, who healed on the Sabbath, he's, he's violating the Sabbath law a law that they did not hold themselves accountable to when it came to their own personal possessions. And in fact, as we've already noted, they would exalt the value of an animal, a donkey, a sheep, or an ox over a human being. It's kind of like the folks today who support PETA and are pro-abortion. They're more interested in dogs and cats than human beings. It's a wacky world, folks. No wackier than the first century, though. People are still as inconsistent as they have ever been. Jesus was not violating the Sabbath. He was helping somebody. It is never wrong to do right. Seven days a week. That's really the argument that Jesus made. And they understood it in regard to their livestock, but not in regard to human beings. What was wrong? with those folks. They have the same problem that modern folks have. Not only did they accuse him of violating the Sabbath, but they indicted him as a blasphemer, a slanderer against God. He equates himself with God. He says, I am the Son of God. That makes him equal with God. We cannot abide this. This can't stand. But aren't we not all, in one way, children of God? John wrote, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. 1 John 3, 1. And did not the Lord himself teach his disciples when they came to him and said, John taught his disciples how to pray. How should we pray? He said, Pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Equating God as his Father should not have raised an eyebrow because we are all children of God in the great creation narrative of Genesis 1 and 2. But yes, Jesus had more in mind than that. But they couldn't fully understand it at this point. And the charges they're leveling, they're not leveling because they have some tremendous respect for God. They just have a great dislike for Jesus. And when you don't like somebody, you just start snatching at straws. Anything and everything that can be twisted and turned in a critical manner is used. And people are still that way. As much as human civilization has changed technologically, people are still the same. That's why the Bible, though it is an ancient text, has real relevance in the 21st century because people today are like people in our Lord's day. They're like the folks in the days of Moses. They're like the folks in the days of Abraham and like the folks shortly after the fall in Genesis 3, the story of Adam and Eve. Jesus responded that he and the Father were one. They didn't like that, but it was true. They were one. They were one in the sense that their actions are the same. In essence, their goals are the same. They're fully together in why he'd come, what he would do, 
and what he would accomplish. Furthermore, they're one in judgment. And by the way, if you look at this text and pay careful attention to verses 28 29, he said, The hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation or condemnation. And who will be the judge on that day? The Son, who is co equal with the Father and does the bidding of the Father. And what will be the verdict rendered in that judgment? He does not make that determination, folks. We make that ourselves. By our choice to obey him or to reject him, to live by his standards or to live by our own standards, to put others first or put ourselves first, to be givers or getters, to be servants or to be served, to live holy or unholy. And we all make those choices. And all Jesus will do in judgment, and that day's coming for all of us, is honor the choices that we make this side of the grave. Now very quickly, he, through the remainder of the text, offers evidence for his divinity. He begins with an acknowledgement of his own personal testimony that he is the Son of God. And he says, honestly, if that's all there is, that's not enough. Any man can say anything, and it doesn't have to be true to be said. I've told you many times I'm a fantastic golfer, but one outing would demonstrate unequivocally that that's not true. Well, I ain't. I could tell you that I'm a great fisherman, but I have very little success. I like to fish because I'm usually fishing with my son, and anything he and I do together, I thoroughly enjoy. I can tell you all kinds of stories. That's easy to do, but the truth comes in the action. So Jesus says, if all you've got to go on is the fact that I am the Father or one, I recognize that's not enough. But you've got more than that. You've got John's testimony. This is John the Immerser. In fact, the Gospel of John, if you've been here for our studies, in chapters 1 and 3 have John declaring he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's the Son of God. He must increase. I must decrease. And John is the greatest prophet born among women. If you can't believe John, who can you believe? But Jesus doesn't stop there. He goes on to say, the works that I do, they bear witness of who I am. If you were here for our study of chapter 3, the account of Jesus engaging Nicodemus in conversation tells us that Nicodemus came that night to Jesus saying, Rabbi or teacher, we know that you come from God for no man can do the miracles that you do except God be with him. He walked on the water. He stilled the tempest. He healed the lame. He gave sight to the blind. He caused the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. He raised the dead. And you want to tell me he's just another one of us? Just an ordinary guy? I don't think so. No man can do the things, the miracles you do, except God be with him. Then you have the testimony of the Father himself. That testimony was heard on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. It was heard at his baptism when John immersed Jesus in the water and raised him up. God from heaven declared, This is my beloved Son. But it doesn't stop there. John also tells us, that Jesus said in verse 39, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have everlasting life, and they are they which testify of me. And when he made that statement, the New Testament, none of it had been written. So the scriptures that he references are what we commonly refer to as the Old Testament today. He said in the Old Testament, Genesis to Malachi, you find the testimony of the prophets concerning me. 
all of that prophetic literature was written between 250 and 1600 years before Jesus came. How did Moses describe the coming of Christ as the one who would be the great sin bearer in Leviticus 16, 1600 years before Jesus was even born? How could Isaiah in chapter 53 of his book give a graphic description of the crucifixion of Christ when he hasn't even been born and won't be born for 600 plus years? Even Daniel, when he interpreted the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, was able to pinpoint the very time when God would set up his kingdom in the days of these kings, the Romans. Universally understood to mean that God's kingdom would be established during the Roman Empire, Daniel 2.44. And even if you are a liberal scholar, you have to admit that Daniel was written at least 200 to 250 years before Jesus was born. Tell me, tell me what was, will happen 250 years from today here in Marietta. And you can't do it. And how could they do it? Because they were the servants of the Most High God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And as Isaiah 46, 10 declares, he knows the end from the beginning. We don't. He does. And he laid it out long before Jesus came. And Jesus fulfilled it all. I will tell you, if you continue to look at John's Gospel, you'll find two other additional witnesses that give validity to our faith. You have the Holy Spirit himself. In addition to chapter 15, 26, you might want to look at 16, 13. Go back to chapter 14 and look at verse 26. It's the same affirmation. When I return to the Father, I will have the Father send the Holy Spirit, and he will guide you into all truth. Now, please note, that was not a promise Jesus made to me or you. That was a promise he made to the 12. And the product of that promises fulfillment we hold in our hands when we take in our hand the New Testament, the work of the Holy Spirit giving validity to who Jesus was, what he did, and what he demands. And furthermore, he said to the disciples themselves, you too will be witnesses. You take those seven proofs of the deity of Christ and they really are unassailable. That's why I don't have any hesitation to tell you tonight that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by him, John 14, 6. I am so weary of hearing people all over this land say, you can't be too dogmatic, too judgmental. You've got to recognize there's good in every religion and one is as acceptable as another. And don't you dare speak ill of anyone or anything else. But the fact is, only Christians can point to Christ, the Son of God, as Savior. Only Christians can point to an empty tomb and say, yes, they nailed him to a cross, and yes, they placed him in that tomb. But early that Sunday morning, the stone was rolled away, and the tomb was empty. He was alive, and he still is. No other religion rests on that kind of foundation. So don't tell me that Islam and Christianity are equal or that Hinduism or Buddhism and Christianity are equal. They are not. Are folks in those religions good people? I don't doubt that they're not morally upright. I don't doubt that they're sincere. I don't doubt that they want to be what they perceive they ought to be. But the reality is only in Jesus do we find a real remedy for sin, his precious blood, and only in him can we know forgiveness and hope for eternity. That's the message of John 5. I hope you leave with a better appreciation of who Jesus was. And if you had any doubts at all about his divinity, you just listen to his word and recognize the validity of the arguments he makes and the doubts will vanish. Again, we say with Paul, I know 
whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. In essence, you put your trust in Jesus, obey his gospel, and live for him, and you will live with him eternally. And turn your back. When that day comes, and it's coming, and judgment occurs, he will be compelled to say, depart. I know you're not. It's just that simple. And again, I'm not the judge. He is. But this is the standard he will use. Know it, believe it, obey it, live it, and you have nothing to fear. Ignore it, and you'll find yourself in a far worse state than that man who for 38 years dealt with his physical affirmity. And it does not need to be. If you're subject to his invitation, we invite you to come as together we stand and sing. What will he do with me? Jesus is standing on trial still. You can be false to him if you will. You can be faithful through good or ill. What will you do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus, my friend? Neutral you cannot be. Someday your heart will be asking a friend, what will he do with me? Will you invade him as part of tried, or will you choose him whatever time? Bring the you struggle from him to hide, what will you do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus, my friend? Neutral you cannot be. Someday your heart will be asking a friend, what will he do with me? Will you, like Peter, your Lord, deny? Or will you scorn for his falls to fly, daring for Jesus to live or die? What will you do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus, my friend? Neutral you cannot be. Someday your heart will be asking a friend, what will he do? Today, Jesus, I'll follow thee all the way, gladly obeying thee where you say, this will I do with Jesus. What will you do with Jesus, my friend? Neutral you cannot be. Someday your heart will be asking a friend, what will he do with me? Closing song will be number 104. Thank you, Roger, for another excellent lesson. I hope you appreciate the continued study from the book of John. Number of announcements among the ill to keep in our prayers. Uh, Carolyn Majors is at Selby. Cashton Keeney, that is Carla Baldwin's uh, great nephew, is now out of the hospital. Uh, Kenneth Bourne was in the hospital and is now home. Robert Patterson Jr. and Joyce Ross are now also home. Reminder uh, that the photography dates are quickly approaching for the directory update for the church. Uh, there's been a table available today to sign up for uh, times to have your photos taken. Uh, that should be available for several more services. 
Uh, we have several sign-up sheets out in the, uh, in the lobby. Uh, if you'd like to help with that effort of coordinating uh, the sign-ups or uh, the actual photography times, there's still a, a need for volunteers. Remind you that uh, following our services this evening, we are having our Sunday Sunday Fellowship opportunity. Uh, so I know there are some things other than ice cream in there. I know there's at least one cobbler waiting. So even if you're not a big dairy fan, there's other things to enjoy. The annual Father-Son Campout is coming up. That will be August 4th through the 6th at Wolf Run State Park. The Congregational Picnic is coming up in August. That will be August 12th from 4 to 8 p.m at the Oak Grove Recreational Center. If you have not had an opportunity to partake of communion, it has been prepared. As we sing the last song, you're invited to exit through the rear of the auditorium, take two rights, and you'll end up in our conference room where there'll be men there waiting to serve you. Following that final song, Darrell Haig will lead our minds in prayer, in a closing prayer. I want to thank those who took a public part this evening, Tim for leading our singing, and John for leading our opening prayer. Tim? Number 104104, if you're able to please stand. There is Lord Jesus, the love please. Dear Lord, we come to you at the end of this Lord's Day, thanking you for allowing us to come out today and hear two wonderful messages from your word. We ask this time, dear Lord, that you please be with all of us in our everyday walks of life. Please help us to serve you the best that we can each and every day. At this time, dear Lord, as many of us go and, and enjoy the fellowship and the ice cream and, and whatnot that's been provided, we ask that you please bless those hands that have prepared it, and please bless it to our bodies, and, and please help us to enjoy the fellowship and, and the opportunity to spend time with, with our church family. Also, please be with us later on this evening, dear Lord, as we travel back to our homes. Please help us to make it there safely and return here at the next point in time. It's in your son's holy and blessed name we pray.